Have you ever been out for a walk and avoided a hollow tree that had a certain vibe about it? Or have you ever lost your keys and yelled at your house to please give them back? Or as a young child, did you ever, on impulse, leave some flowers on a rock as a sort of a gift to the invisible people? If so, you may have inherited a wee bit of the old fairy faith. The so-called fairy faith is actually a loose set of beliefs or superstitions that have lived in Ireland for countless ages, and they're still adhered to by many people today. To start off though, we need to be clear that fairies are not quite the benevolent figures you see in media or read about in so-called fairy tales. In fact, a good deal of our modern ideas about them come from the Victorians. In the midst of industrialization and urbanization, 19th century middle class people romanticized a lot of things, including nature, pastoral life, and the ideal family. Many study old folk tales and customs. Others took inspiration from them. This resulted in more homogenized and pacified versions of fairies suited to the Victorian worldview. In short, they made them socially acceptable. And of course, this is where our beloved Peter Pan comes from, as well as our notions of tiny winged people flitting about garden flowers. Now, the real fairy folk are a lot more complex, more powerful, and often very frightening. They come in all shapes and sizes. The great Irish poet W.B. Yeats split the fairies into two groups, trooping fairies and solitary fairies. Trooping fairies are the more organized and account for the royal fairies of legend, while solitary fairies make up the more dangerous, personal, and well-known creatures such as leprechauns and pukas. And here's an essential point. They do not like being called fairies, especially around where they live. The word fairy is English with old roots in Old French, where it usually implied illusion or enchantment. It implied deception or supernatural fate, so essentially it's a bit derogatory. The Irish have usually referred to these magical people as the fair folk, the others, or their oldest name, the she. This ancient name can be roughly translated to still folk, or the people who move silently. The name implies an essential truth about the fairies, that they move where we cannot see or cannot go. The she were once considered a powerful parallel civilization, often very hostile towards humans, or at least easily annoyed by them. Their anger or simple mischievousness could result in simple pranks such as curdling milk or serious acts like killing livestock, stealing children, or abducting people away for years. So a great deal of the fairy faith revolved around developing good relations with the she. It was more common sense diplomacy than anything else, though a respectful relationship or even a friendship with the she could have its benefits. One fun example of this is the medieval Scottish legend of Thomas the Rhymer. He was a real-life laird and a poet whom they say met the Elf Queen one day in the forest. The Queen shows Thomas three marvels, the road to heaven, the road to hell, and the road to her own world, to which they go. After seven years in Elfland, Thomas is brought back to the mortal realm. Asking for a token by which to remember the Queen, he is offered a choice, either the power of great harpistry or the power of prophecy. Thomas chooses the latter, and it is said that he predicted many important events of Scottish history. Some stories say the fair folk live in a parallel world to ours, others that their homes are literally inside objects around us. She homes and gateways are all around if you know where to look. Prominent landscape features like boulders are one form, clefts in rocks of almost any decent size could be, then there are the so-called fairy trees. They're easy to spot if you know what to look for. Picture a tree that seems very old and overgrown. It's often in the middle of otherwise developed land, a tree that clearly has been protected and left to grow wild. Usually it's a hawthorn or a whitethorn. The most famous of the fairy trees is a hawthorn in County Clare, some residents believe two rival clans of fairy meet at the tree to parlay or even do battle. In 1999, the M18 motorway's upgrade was rerouted and delayed for a whole decade because the County Clare Council ordered that the tree be protected. Yet, yeah, they took it that seriously. See, destroying or moving a tree can bring years of bad luck, or even worse. Nobody wanted to take any chances. Conversely, people will often visit fairy trees to seek help from the she. Brightly colored rags are tied to the branches as gifts. 
According to legend, the Shi will impart good fortune or health in return. Hawthorns adorned with such tokens are thus called rag trees. Another fairy home location is the so-called fairy forts or ring forts. These forts, originally known as leos or roths, were in fact the remains of stone or earth enclosures used to protect sheep and cattle. Their use dropped off in the 17th century, but the forts remained. Hence, beliefs evolved that they were actually she homes and even connected to each other underground. Some locals will still steer clear of these places even today unless they feel they've been specifically invited to enter. Similarly, fairies are often associated with ancient hill forts, tombs, or other prehistoric sites scattered across Ireland. Immeasurably valuable to archaeologists, these sites were always familiar to the locals, but they had no idea what their origins were. According to some lore, the Shi are spirits descended from the semi-mythic Tuatha de Danann, the legendary rulers of Ireland. In light of that idea, it makes sense that these ruins are respected places where, to this day, people claim the connection to the Shi is the strongest. What if you suspect a fairy gate is right there on your property? Well, there are ways to test. For instance, before building a house, settlers would often shove a spade into the ground or arrange a special row of stones. If either the spade or the rocks were disturbed overnight, it was a clear sign that the land was already claimed by the Shi. If you still wanted to occupy the land, you'd best make some offerings or set aside an area for them. The trees we've already mentioned come into play here. How would the old-timers deal with the Shi on a daily basis? Well, first off, leave those big fairy folk alone. For the small Shi, the lower-ranking ones who might live near or even in your home, there were a number of best practices. One was to leave food and water out for the little people at night. Or on special holidays such as Samhain, you might go out of your way to give them something really nice to eat and drink. A related example is the Puka's share. In this custom, a farmer would leave a portion of his crop untouched so that spirits called pukas, which are related to the she in many ways, would have something to eat. You could also make a habit of leaving embers going in the hearth overnight for the little people to use. As in other parts of Europe, the Irish believed that the invisible folk respected a clean and organized home. Friendship with your local she could be very beneficial, actually, because they would protect your animals and your house, and in some cases, they might even smite your enemies for you. The two biggest no-nos in the presence of the Shi are lying and stealing, especially stealing from them. Theft from a Shi can result in calamity. Minor offenses might be avenged by turning your cream sour or injuring your livestock. Greater offenses or slights against a very powerful Shi could lead to fires, blight, sickly children, or even madness. Some stories even blame the Shi for causing the Great Potato Famine of the 1840s. Okay, so what if you've done nothing wrong, but have an especially mischievous or evil she bothering you? Well, one option is to use iron, especially cold iron, which basically refers to iron that's been forged into something. Iron gates, iron crosses, and even some nails or knife blades left on the windowsill can help keep the spirits out. Another ward against the folk is to carry some twigs of rowan about you. You can also hang rowan around the house. Not sure why they dislike it, but apparently they do. If you're devoutly Christian, keeping a crucifix around is always a good idea, of course. But the bottom line is to be cautious, because if a powerful fairy is angry with you, none of these things will do much to stop them in the long run. You may be wondering by now if you can actually see a fairy. I mean, how do you know they're really there? Well, some fairy believers do say you can see fairies under the right conditions. No surprise, they say the she are more visible to children than adults. In theory, this is because as we grow up, we are trained to think in linear, regimented patterns. But the Shi simply do not move in straight lines. They have no boundaries like we do, so we basically close ourselves off from them. Another idea is that perceiving fairies is a function of our senses which we don't usually develop, sort of a sixth sense. By this theory, the Shi are similar to ghosts, and you often feel them more than actually see them. Believers will tell you that practices like meditation in nature can help you hone your fairy sense. But remember, the fair folk can control what you see. They'll only become visible to those who approach with caution and respect. 
Okay, so obviously if some people think you can actually see fairies, it means they believe they are real. In other words, the fairy faith is still going strong. In the 21st century, the spectrum of people who believe is wide. Some see the fairies as absolutely real, real enough to get a highway rerouted at least. The Irish Folklore Commission has recorded thousands of contemporary stories from all across Ireland about incidents and experiences involving fairies. Some see the she as imaginary, but enact the faith anyway. And then there's a middle ground of people who see the she as existing somewhere in between, partly real, partly only in our minds, existing in both and neither at the same time. And so we enter the realm of psychology. As we mentioned, middle-class Victorians had a big interest in fairies and spiritualism in general. This was in large part a reaction to industrialization and a desire to recapture a sense of connection to folk traditions and to nature itself. Idyllic visions of country life were all the rage, and 19th century folklorists scoured the countryside for every scrap of lore they could find. It seemed to satisfy a basic need, and this is still true for many people today. The fairy faith seems to be a reaction to materialism and rampant progress. What may have once been an outgrowth of fear of the unknown seems now to be a reaction to unease with our own civilization. You might call it a form of therapy. Some people do take the fairy faith as sort of a guide for living, respect nature, live simply, be kind and unselfish. Those aren't bad ideas all in all. I suppose in the final analysis the question is this, can believing in fairies improve your quality of life? Well, that's your call, but there's probably no harm in doffing your cap the next time you pass that weird old tree. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that this helped illustrate a little bit of what the fairy faith is about. It's a very big topic. If you're curious to learn more, check out the description below where we have a couple of book links for you. In the meantime, check out our other Irish content over here. No matter how you spend your day, get out in nature. Say hi to the fairies for us. Sancha.